Fightcom. And with me is one of my favorite people, Joe Gavazzi. What I'm going to do is before we actually begin and he gets to talk college basketball, I just want to preface by I've been a fan of Joe Gavazzi for a very long time. I remember being a kid at my parents' house. And one of the reasons I respect Joe so much is he was around in the era when the industry was full of scumbags and it was so easy to just say whatever the hell you wanted because there was no transparency, there was no internet, there was no way to like trust if anything was legitimate. And Joe, for how long he's been in this game, and Joe, I'm not trying to age or anything because you know clearly Marco has been in the game a long time too, is it's almost impossible, even the biggest haters out there, if you went on Google, to find really anything negative whatsoever of boiler room tactics, double siding, anything scummy with Joe. So for a guy who was in the industry, it would have been so easy for him with his knowledge of the game and his brand to maybe take some shortcuts to make that extra money. He always kept his integrity. He was always an honest guy, and I've always been a big fan. So to be honest, it's a pleasure of mine to actually be doing this webinar with uh, Mr. Joe Gavazzi. And one of the reasons I hand-selected Joe to do this webinar is college basketball, as I said in the other webinars, is a unique animal. There's so many teams. There is so many players, unlike you know even college football, that is so more complex than, say, the NFL with the amount of teams. There's even more in college basketball. You know, you're not betting Detroit University in college football on a Saturday, but you get to bet Detroit U in college basketball. And all these obscure conferences that aren't part of the normal rotation for football are part of the normal rotation in basketball. So that being said, in my eyes, I got Joe Gavazzi, one of the, the top experts, not just in college basketball, but one of the top experts in college basketball in its relationship to sports betting. Joe sent me a couple talking points he wants to talk about. Before we get into that, Joe, I want to give you a couple minutes. Um, kind of let me know a little bit about yourself, your resume, and, and why the people who are not only listening and watching now and the ones who are going to be watching when this is archived why they should give a shit on what Joe Gavazzi has to say. First of all, John, I want to thank you for the very kind words and the introduction. I have been doing this since 1979, 34 straight years. In fact, we're at the point where we have now turned out games in football, basketball, and baseball 12,500 consecutive days. It speaks to the amount of hard work that is necessary to being a success in this industry. No question about that. I do, however, think that college hoops is my first love, and I do think that in no small part that is because this is where the money is. You've got 250 online teams now playing 30 or more games. That's a minimum of 7,500 opportunities for you to make money with college basketball teams this year. And you've got to look at fundamentals first when you're handling handicapping that, and uh, we'll get into that in just a moment. I want you to know that I'm out here working for you each and every day, probably about 80, 90 hours a week on college basketball. One of the things I've done for 35 years, which I think may be unique in the entire industry, is that back in 1979, I started my stat and log book, and for the last 34 years, I have hand logged every college basketball game that has been played by sight and by line. Get the and hell out of four. here. Are you that, serious? That is a true story. 12,500 days we've been in the business. I've done it every day for college basketball. I've got 35 of these stat and log books going back to 1979. So that, You should sell that on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it has much value now to anybody. Uh, but um, uh, certainly as... as Things have changed in this high-tech era where most of that information is available. But really the value that it has for me is simply experiencing each game, game by game, seeing the streaks of each team, the current form of each team, and uh, melding that with the past history that I know about each team to come up with a, a, a value formulation each day. And I want to stay with value for just a second here, something that I really didn't put in these talking points very much. But value is at the heart of having a successful college basketball season. One well, of the first things I did before I even started the industry was a money management treatise I wrote back in 1979. 
and I write each day, but that may be the best thing that I've written. It teaches you how to not only manage your money properly, stay patient, stay disciplined, always shop for value, and know that if you use the money management system, that you're going to multiply your profits and winning streaks and cut short those losing streaks. That is absolutely essential to managing your emotions. You've got to take the emotion out of college hoops because anybody who, college, who follows college hoops knows, particularly once January starts, 42% of the games, and yes, I track the margin of every game against the spread. We call it our AFP, away from the point spread uh, margin. I track it on each and every game. 42% of the games, once the conference season starts, are decided by less than five points from the line. Not the three point of this missed, a long rebound, and two points on the other end. It happens every night in less than five seconds of time. That's why every half point is absolutely essential and crucial. You gotta shop till you drop to make sure you maximize your profits. And you absolutely have to use a money management system, which will take the emotion out of your betting, teach you to maximize your profits and winning streaks and limit your losing streaks. With that said, let's get into any particular questions or comments that we have. I I, I would really like to share the, the kind of preseason work I do, kind of let the people know but if they are self-handicappers out there, that I feel they should be doing as well. Well, uh, I think some, like of your, some of your talking points are great. So what I'd like to do is kind of go over them. And, and if we use up most of our time, so be it. And then what we'll do is over in the community, I'll open up the webinar. You know, I'm going to post it in there, you know, an hour once we get finished. And a lot of people ask questions. But, you know, I'm kind of sitting there like a kid in the candy store. And the funny thing is, is everyone I've done a webinar with who I deem as someone who is really knowledgeable in college basketball, Ken Thompson, Essler, Shaker, they've all wanted to talk about the infamous rule changes. So for somebody who has handwritten all of these games for all of these years, I am dying to hear what you have to say about the rule changes. And just real quick to kind of um, summarize some of the stuff that's been brought up is the fact that there could be more fouls, but there's been kind of a disagreement on what that really means some people i'm hearing are saying well that means more scoring because the game's slower and more foul shots i've also heard the fact that if you look over the last x amount of years less and less foul shots when the guy gets to the foul line are being made so it's being more foul shots doesn't necessarily mean more scoring because this newer generation doesn't shoot foul shots as consistently and one of the things that i felt too in college, especially in some of these lesser tier teams, is once you get past, unless you're a Kentucky, is once you get past that starting lineup and you get to the bench players, they're less likely lineup. to be able to score like the studs who start the game. So if these rule changes are going to have more fouls and your starters are more likely until they get used to it since they've been playing with certain rules their whole life and maybe the reps – you know, are, are calling so many fouls because they're trying to figure out how to call these new rule changes. If more of these bench players are going to be involved with the game, that could, to me could also mean less scoring. But I've heard every argument, and they all are pretty sound reasoning behind it. So, Joe, the rule changes, what does it mean to you, and what do you think it means in regards to totals, in regards to scoring? Sure. I think that we're at the point where with most rule changes, that it's a wait and see. Now, in college basketball, you can't wait and see very long because the line maker is sharp enough to make these adjustments very, very fast. But one of the things we have to watch is not only how these, how these rules are going to be called in non-conference play versus conference play, but from conference to conference too. And it's going to be hard for us to, to make some judgments on this. What we know is the scoring hit an all-time low of 135 points a game here, here last year. And Really, most of the games, many of the games, weren't that much fun to watch. I'm an open court fan, and I think it's pretty clear that the rule changes, at least clear to me, that the rule changes are going to limit the hand checking on the outside. Uh, the block charge call is going to uh, make the lane open up a little bit. From what I can see, mm -hmm. all of the changes that are made are aimed at increasing the speed of the game, letting the game flow more easily, and opening up the lane. I think this is going to lead to higher scoring. I can take a couple of examples in my hometown. Anybody who's watched Big East basketball has seen Pitt 
under first Ben Howell and then Jamie Dixon just beat the crap out of some teams. And they are a very, very physical, defensive-oriented basketball team. I think Pitt's going to have to make some adjustments in order to succeed with these new rules. On the other hand is a team like Duquesne. Jim Ferry's here from LIU Brooklyn. Most of you didn't watch any Duquesne basketball last year. But most of you did watch some NCAA basketball with LIU Brooklyn the previous two years when Jim Ferry coached. Ferry loves to run it up and down the court. Ferry only has three scholarship players returning at Duquesne. But these rules are going to benefit him tremendously. And his first scrimmage, if you will, versus Slippery Rock, the Dukes went for 102 points a game and allowed the other team almost that many. And in that regard, we have to begin to watch for those of you who follow college basketball over-unders to see what that average score is going to be up from 135 and how quickly the line makers are able to adjust on that over-under average. I think the game is going to speed up. I think it's going to help teams who are in the open court, and I think it's going to cause some problems for teams who insist on playing in the half court and playing a rugged defensive style such as the Pitt Panthers. Next one. Type of teams on whom you should focus in the early going. Um, I'll, I'll never forget this. I saw an odds maker one time I was in Vegas, and we were wrapping and hit this giant, this was going actually going into football season, and he had this giant like press media guy that was about all the teams. I said, what are you doing? He goes, researching. And he looked at me, he goes, you think we really know everything about all of these, you know, lesser schools with all of the graduations and changes and coaching and schemes. He goes, you know, we got to kind of stick to some basic stuff off last year, some power ratings and try learning as much as we can. And there's such an edge early in the season. I mean, everybody knows about the kids at Kentucky, um, you know, the kids at Michigan state, you know, it is though how he's going to play and not saying you can't have an edge. Does he do certain things early in the season or against certain teams? I'm not saying that. But some of these lesser conferences, I just find it almost impossible. And I've spoken with odds makers for them to have accurate lines and projections. So what are you one what is your thoughts, one, on that? And two, what are types of teams you should be focusing on early in the college basketball season? Sure. I think that uh, first of all, you're absolutely right. And let's take it one step further into the overall schemata of the betting world. Las Vegas has Las Vegas in the betting world has the biggest handle on NFL games. Well, they are obligated to know everything about those 32 teams, and there's very rarely a bad line in the NFL. Now, as we spoke at the beginning, there are 250 college basketball teams. Maybe there are 100 college basketball teams, probably the big name college football teams, that the average better is going to follow. Well, that leaves 150 college basketball teams that the average player isn't going to even look at. In fact, I'm going to guess that if Idaho State is playing, there's not going to be more than $1,000 bet on the game. But the point is that there should be more time spent on the teams about which the line maker knows less about, because that's where your biggest edge is spoke about the fact that 42% of the games once the conference season started are decided by five or less points. In November, only 32% of the games are decided by five or less points from the opening line. That in itself tells you that there's a tremendous advantage in playing this time of year in college hoops. I know everybody's into football. Everybody is, is, is following the, the uh, top five college team. Everybody wants to know what's going to happen to BCS. If you're in it for the money, college basketball in the early going is the place to be, and the place to be in, in particular are these smaller college teams, many of whom might be rebuilding, many of whom might have five returning starters who won 20 games. And that's where you can make some meaningful cash in, on these teams. One further point in that regard, in the years that gone by, even though the line maker may not be focusing on college basketball quite as much, he certainly is doing an excellent job making line adjustments once the momentum begins to swing. You have limited opportunity for 
the line catches up, up to teams. It's not like back in the 80s when you could wait two or three or four games and then make your move and still have value. Value is leaving quickly. You've got to act fast when you find something that's either outstandingly bad about a team or very good. In that regard, with those 250 teams, now there are more and more players who aren't going to be eligible at the start of the year. Many of these players come in after four or five weeks of the season has started when the first semester is over. It's really important to follow the mid-season player additions and, and, and as well key injuries. Football players, you can have an injury and, and easily make that up because there are 11 guys on the field. One dominant player on a small college team is a big, big deal. So following injuries is important as well. Speaking of starters and players, one of the other ones, the third bullet point you sent me, is returning starter criteria. And one thing I've heard from a lot of people is they like to look at, you know, the smaller schools or the lesser schools where they're getting, they're focusing on like the guard positions, you know, the guy that's running the offense or, or you know, running the schemes. And if there's certain chemistry with certain players, and they like to focus on those teams early and often. What is your thoughts on returning starter criteria? Well, I'm a little bit old school in a way. Um, many years ago, I set up a, a criteria for returning starters. Teams with um, three returning starters or more have to have won 25 games for me to have considered them an experienced team. Teams with four returning starters, I lessen the criteria to 20 games, and teams with five returning starters need only have won 18 games. Now that gives me a list, which of course I've already made this year, of five returning starters who have won eight, five returning starters on teams who have won 18 games or more, 22 with four returning starters, and 14 with the three returning starters for a total of 41 games that I will be qualifying as returning starter teams. But just like in football, there's more to going from year to year, season to season, than just analyzing the raw data. And this ties in with your, with your talking point about the point guards. You must have the continuity of a coach who comes back, and you must have the continuity of a point guard or at least veteran guard play. In the early going and, and all through the year, I'm uh, still a huge believer on guard play being a big indicator of point spread success. And when you have a veteran guard, guard tandem, along with a starting point guard and a returning coach on one of my 41 teams, then you have something to look at, particularly if this team slides into an underdog role. Speaking of coaches, that is number four. Coaching personality trends. To me, you know, the NBA, a lot of times the players, unfortunately, sometimes do what they want to do. And not to say coaches don't have some type of impact on the game, but in college, if Coach K or Izzo, what they say goes, and you better play what the hell they say to do. And to me, there's more of, I guess, the personality. There's more of the rivalry. There's more of, you know, if the Pistons coach, you know, he's probably playing a different coach if he's playing the Bucks every couple of years, different coaches. They're not recruiting, they're drafting. So, you know, you have when Michigan plays Michigan State, you know, I know it's really important for them because the kid who's going to Pershing might be watching the game and they're trying they're going to be they're going to try recruiting that kid in a couple months. So, coaching personality trends. What are some things that you would say to look for and what are some examples you could share with the people watching and listening? I'm thinking that one of the biggest coaching personality trends often revolves around the home road dichotomies of of these teams. Using some of the points that you talk up, coach K at Duke or Tom Izzo they have tremendous individual point spread personality coaching trends that you can follow and make huge profits on. I'm going to share one of these with you from the Michigan State profile of Tom Izzo, who's been there for 18 years. And this is something that we will continue to make money with over the years. And please, this is a freebie for you guys. <laughs> Tom Izzo when laying more than four points at home is 83 and 42 against the point spread 
with four or more days rest. It's as easy as that. You give him time to prepare for a home game, he's going to beat the number 67% of the time. Now, within that 83 and 42, there's a sweet 45 and 6, which I'm not going to share with you guys right now, but believe me, it's out there. <laughs> It is like money in the bank. I salivate when this one pops up. Hey, like like we said in the couple we had over the last couple days is I just appreciate the time, you know, the pros are taking to share as much as possible. I can't expect everyone to give away um, all their bags of tricks. we got about seven minutes left, so I'm going to go to a couple more, and then I want to talk about your upcoming package, and I'm going to let you close like I always do at pregame. 90-plus percent of what we do is 100% complimentary videos, audio, um, you know, the Judge Joe, all the stuff we provide. If somebody decides that they want to invest in a pro, they could do so. Nobody is forced to do. But at the same time, it's how we pay the bills. So when we get at the end, I'm going to let you kind of let people know why they should invest in, in Joe Gavazzi. But I want to go over two more things. Uh, one is fundamental edges. What do you mean by that? Well, fundamental edges, uh, you can look at all the home road dichotomies you want and all the tech aspects college basketball handicapping, and they are important, but it is fundamentals which more often than not win basketball games, both in the terms of matchups but in terms of the overall schemata as well. First of all, on offense, you must take care of the basketball. If you look at a team who has 12 or less times in a game in which they turn it over, and you'll see a team who beats the point spread way more often than not. On defense, and rebounding, we've got the other side of the coin. You must play solid defense, allowing under 40% from the field, allowing under 30% from the arc, and you must have a positive rebound margin of plus five or more to be considered a quality defense and rebounding team. So from a fundamental perspective, we're looking to take care of basketball on, on the offense, defense and rebounding on the defense. You know, for years I coached a bunch of kids who are between the ages of 8 and 14, and what a great opportunity to build in into their mentality just those points. And when you see it takes hold in kids that young, then it, really starts, then it really starts to have some meaning for you on a personal level. So you got, you've been writing every basketball game now for 30-something years, and you're coaching the teams. Did you guys cover the spread a lot? Was there any certain trends? With your uh, little league team, I, I coach my little sure. boys' soccer team, and I make lines every week. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I I certainly had a point spread pattern. If there were point spread patterns on the game, and uh, my my teams would not have covered very well in the first half of the season, but we kind of peaked from the playoffs game. If, if Joe Joe had more than four days in between games, he he covered the spread eighty two percent of the time. So the most important before we get to, to talking about your, your actual college basketball season is shopping for the best lines. And I know you already talked about it, but I'll let you go into it a little bit deeper. And to me, this is one of the things that I guess frustrates me more than anything. And it's to kind of use a comparison is I could always tell someone who is probably better than the average bear of poker is when someone tells a bad beat or talks about a story, it's they talk about the hand. Then you have another person, same situation, but they talk about what was in the pot, where they were sitting, how many chips the other guy had. And there's so many other things that go into it. And you could always tell when somebody will say, you know, I love Michigan today versus, you know, I love Michigan minus the seven. Liking a team and mm -hmm. liking a team with a specific line or up to a certain parameter to me, is such a big difference in winning and losing. And the easiest way that I break it down when I try telling people the importance of line shopping is I said, do a little simple test so you can visually see it. Because a lot of times I could say it, but visually seeing something works so well for most people. Go to whatever shop you're at. And in the drop down, buy half a point or a point, college basketball, NBA, whatever it may be, and tell me what it says. Does it say minus 120? Does it say minus 130? Whatever it is for how many points you're buying. And if the answer is yes, by line shopping, you could do the exact same thing, not all the time, but enough, at minus 110. What sports book can you go to in a drop down and say, I want to buy 
take Michigan from plus seven to plus seven and a half against State, and I'm going to pay minus 110. The sports book would go out of business. But by line shopping, you technically could do that. It just baffles me that people don't understand that. So I'm going to let you talk about line shopping, and then I'm going to close out talking about you and then let you let people know why they should invest with you. So what's some good advice you can give for line shopping, or I guess how can you pound it into people's head, the importance of doing so? Each day, there are several parts of, of sports betting handicapping which lead you into your final choices. In fact, you might come down to 10 final choices each day. Then you use game selection management to, let's say, isolate those down to five games. You've done a lot of work to get to those five games. You've done a lot of preseason work. You've done a lot of handicapping that day. You've read some respected opinions. You've talked to some other respected people. But unless you keep working when you are going out to shop for those lines and making those bets, you have not done your job. Because getting the best line you can for the best for each game you bet is just as much a part of your job as handicapping the game. Every half point is meaningful in, in especially college basketball betting. The later you go in the season, the more, more valuable it is. So I strongly, strongly urge you, shop at multiple outs to find the best line available it will reward you handsomely in the end. When you sit down and think about the difference between a 50, 55% year and a 57% year, and it's only because you didn't shop for the best number available, you will see just how much you cost yourself. Exactly. And I, and I don't know if you're just doing this via the phone or if you're in front of a computer, but I pulled up my sports options. And, you know, just for, say, for right now, LA Clippers in Miami. If you like the over, Catalina, some headcount shops. They have 207. Like the under, the William Hill shops have 208 and a half. Go to your local or log into your online sports book and try buy a point and a half on NBA total and tell me how much that cost you. What I did just took me literally a couple seconds long. And depending whether I like the over or the under, I was able to get a point and a half. If I like Miami, I could get five and a half at one place. If I like the other side, Crib just went to six and a half plus on the Clippers. Clearly. It's all I'm doing is looking and shopping and a point, point and a half is so much value in the long term. It's just idiotic that people don't do that more often. So what I want to do now is Joe has a package up for tonight for all the football. It's on the homepage right now at pregame. You could use coupon code J is in Joe, G is in Gavazi. Yep, I'm really creative. And I'll take half off his football package tonight. And if you want to take $100 off his combo or basketball season, this is only going to be good for 24 hours. JG100. Like I said, I hand-selected the guys in that initial post for people that I know college basketball. Esler, because he's been in the community. I've seen it for years. Brian, because I've known him personally. Ken, he's covered, coached, and a sports radio and lives college basketball. Joe, because like I said, I've been a fan of his since I was a kid. And I followed his work since well before pregame was it was even probably around. And to be honest, probably before the fucking internet was even around. So um, no disrespect in any of the pros. and not saying some of the other pros that I may be left out that they aren't a solid choice. But I picked these guys for a reason. So, Joe, here's the part. I'm going to allow you to be a little marketing. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes before we close out. If I'm sitting here listening and watching this now, or I'm going to be sitting and listening to this in the next hour or so after this is going to be uploaded on the pregame.com website. Why should I invest my money in Joe Gavazzi for the upcoming basketball season? I think one of the best reasons why investment in my service is important is experience. First of all, I love the game of basketball. I've been involved in the game of basketball every fall and winter for over 50 years as a player, as a coach, as a handicapper, as a fan. It is a passion of mine. And when I found out some 34 years ago that I would be able to transfer my passion into something that would be profitable, well, it was really a no-brainer for me. It's a lot of hard work. I probably put in a couple hundred hours already in the preseason getting ready 
for the college basketball season and the NBA season as well. But it always pays off this time of year. If you're going to get involved in one sport at one time of the year with me, it's my college basketball the first two or three months of the season. Two years ago, I broke from the gate at 69 and 29 against the spread. Last year, my top-rated plays were 116 and 73 over the first three months. Sure, we have dips. Everybody has dips. But almost every year, I go with a package of two or 300 games at my streak where I go 60% or higher. I want you to sit down, take pencil to paper, and figure out how much a 60% winning streak over 200 games will get you. I'm often known as a streaky handicapper. That's where the money management system comes in. Use my money management system available to you on pregame and find out how you can multiply your money when you're in a winning streak and limit your losses in a losing streak. That is one of the most important things that you can do. And also, and this is on you as we just spoke about, you must shop for the best value in the line every time out. That can be as, as important as anything in the field of college basketball handicapping and winning. I invite you to join me this college basketball season. I think you'll find it as rewarding as I have in the last 34 seasons. Joe Gavazzi, ladies and gentlemen. Like I said, I've been a big fan for a very long time, and this was my pleasure. Um, you know, me and RG are one of the owners of the site, and I guess one of the important things for me is besides the fact of getting to work from home and work with my passion is getting to meet, do business with a lot of people that I've always admired over the years, and Joe Gavazzi is one of them. So, Joe, I appreciate you taking 30 minutes out of your busy day, especially with college basketball coming. I was kind of shocked when you committed to take um, some time to do the webinar, knowing how much time you do put into college basketball and with it coming up, you know, literally in the next 24 hours. So, on behalf of Pregame.com, he's Joe Gavazzi. I'm Johnny Detroit. I appreciate everyone who took the time to watch us. I appreciate the time that everyone's going to be watching this on the archives. We'll take the time to watch and listen to this. So, from me to you, as always, best of luck.